within the field of exoplanets, because there's different fields of astronomy, but within the field of exoplanets, I think a good expectation is that most of the telescope time that James Lucy have will go towards atmospheric retrieval, which is uh, sort of alluded to earlier, you know, like detecting molecules in the atmospheres, not biosignatures, because as I said, it's really not designed to do that. It's pushing JWST probably too far to expect it to do that. But it could detect, for example, a carbon dioxide rich atmosphere on TRAPPIST-1E. That's not a biosignature, but you could prove it's like a Venus in that case, or maybe like a Mars in that case. Like both those have carbon dioxide rich atmospheres. Doesn't prove or disprove the existence of life either way, but it is our first characterization of the nature of those atmospheres. Maybe we can even tell the pressure level and the temperature of those atmospheres. So that's very exciting. But um, there's we, we are competing with that. And that I, I think that science is completely mind-blowing and fantastic. We have a completely different objective, which is, in our case, to try and look for the first evidence of these small moons around these planets, um, potentially even moons which could be habitable, of course. So I think it's a very exciting goal. But um, attack has to make a human judgment, essentially, about which science are they most excited by, which one has the highest promise of return, the most uh, highest chance of return. And so that's hard because if you look at a, a planetary atmosphere, well, you know most of the time the planet has an atmosphere already. It, it, and so there's almost a guaranteed success that you're going to learn something about the atmosphere mm -hmm. by pointing JWST at it. Whereas in our case, there's a harder sell. We are looking for something that we do not know for sure exists yet or not. And so we are pushing the telescope to do something which is inherently more risky. Yeah, but the existence, if shown, already gives a deep uh, lesson about what's out there in the universe. But that means that other stars have similar types of variety as we have in our solar system. They have an Io, they have a Europa and so on, which means like there's a lot of possibility for icy planets, for water, for planets that enable for planets and moons that, that I mean that that's super exciting because that that means everywhere through our galaxy and beyond th there is just innumerable possibility for weird creatures. I agree. Life forms. I, you don't have to convince me. <laughs> I mean, his, yeah, NASA, NASA has been on this quest for a long time, and it's sometimes called Eater Earth. It's the frequency of Earth-like, usually they say yes. planets in the universe. How common are planets similar to our Earth? In terms of, um, ultimately, we'd like to know everything about these planets in terms of the amount of water they have, how much atmosphere they have. But for now, it's kind of focused just on the size and the distance from the star, essentially. How how often do you get similar conditions to that? Um, that was Kepler's primary mission. And it, it really just kind of flirted with the answer. It didn't quite get to a definitive answer. But I always say, look, if we're looking, if, if that's our primary goal, to look for Earth-like I would say worlds, then moons has to be a part of that because we know that um, Earth-like, so from the Kepler data, the preliminary result is that Earth-like planets around sun-like stars is not an inevitable outcome. It seems to be something like a one to 10% outcome. So it's not particularly inevitable that that happens. But we do often see about half of all sun-like stars have either a mini Neptune, a Neptune, or a Jupiter mm -hmm. in the habitable zone of their stars. That's a very, very common occurrence that we see. Yet we have no idea how often they have moons around them, which could also be habitable. And so there may very well be, if, it, if even one in five of them has an Earth-like moon or even a Mars-like moon around them, mm -hmm. then there would be more habitable real estate in terms of exomoons than exoplanets in the so universe. So you can essentially... 2x, 3x, 5x, maybe 10x the number of habitable, habitable worlds mm -hmm. out there in the universe. Our current estimate for like the Drake equation. Absolutely. Yeah. So this this is a one way to increase the confidence and increase the the value of that parameter. And just know where to look. I mean, we we would like to know where should we listen for techno signatures. Where should we be looking for biosignatures? Um, and not only that, but what role does the does the moon have in terms of its influence on the planet? Um, we talked about these directly imaged telescopes earlier, these missions that want to take a photo, to quote Carl Sagan, the pale blue dot of our planet, but the pale blue dot of an exoplanet. And that's the dream, to one day capture that. But as impressive as the resolution is that we are planning and conspiring to design for the future generation telescopes to achieve that, even those telescopes 
will not have the capability of resolving the Earth and the Moon within that. It will be a pale blue dot pixel, but the Moon's gray grayness will be intermixed mm -hmm. with that pixel. And so this is a big problem because one of the ways that we are claiming to look for life in the universe is a chemical disequilibrium. So you see two molecules that just shouldn't be there. They normally react with each other, or even one molecule that's just too reactive to be hanging around the atmosphere by itself. So if you had um, oxygen and methane hanging out together, those would normally react fairly easily. And so if you detected those two molecules in your pale blue dot spectra, you'd be like, okay, we've, we have evidence for life. Something's metabolizing on this planet. Um, however, the challenge here is what if that moon was Titan? Titan has a methane-rich atmosphere. And what if the pale blue dot was in fact a planet devoid of life, but it had oxygen because of water undergoing this photolysis reaction splitting into oxygen and hydrogen separately? So then you have all of the uh, hallmarks of what we would claim to be life, mm -hmm. but all along you were tricked. It was just a moon that was de deceiving you. And so we are never going to, we're never going to, I would claim, really understand the or complete this quest of looking for life, biosignatures in the universe, unless we have a deep knowledge of the prevalence and role that moons have. They may even affect the habitability of the planets themselves. Of course, our own moon is freakishly large. By mass ratio, it's the largest moon in the solar system. It's a 1% mass moon. If you look at Jupiter's moons, they're like 10 to the power minus four, much smaller. And so our own moon seems to stabilize the obliquity of our planet. It gives rise to tides. Especially early on when the moon was closer, those tides would have covered entire continents. Mm -hmm. And those, those rock pools that would have been scattered across the entire plateau may have been the origin of life on our planet. The moon forming impact may have stripped a significant fraction of the lithosphere off the Earth, which without it, plate tectonics may not have been possible. We'd have had a stagnant lid because there was just too much lithosphere stuck on the top of the, of the planet. And so there are speculative reasons, but intriguing reasons as to why a large moon may be not just important, but central to the question of having the conditions necessary for life. So moons can be habitable in their own right, but they can also play a significant influence on the habitability of the planets they orbit. And further, they will surely interfere with our attempts to detect life remotely from afar.